All right, guys, we are going to be going through books one through four as a set. I don't know if this will all be crammed into one video, but at least spoiler territory for these first four books is how this chat this, this chat is going to be organized. If you're starting here because you Googled one of these books, make sure you start at our Before You Read the Brothers Karamazov, where we're going to go through a lot of the ongoing themes, where we cover a lot of the biographical information that you're going to need to know before you start. So make sure you click on that link before you get started. Uh, welcome. I'm Una. And I'm Brother K Crypto. <laughs> <laughs> brother Una here. <laughs> Hello, brother. So book one, what is book one? People call it an info dump, and I say that is not very polite, but it's kind of accurate. So, <laughs> Yeah, He's... but it, it, there's a lot of information that's given out. That is true, but I don't think it's overloading if you... You take this in chunks like it's meant to be read. You're not supposed to sit down and read all of book one, maybe. Take it in bite-sized pieces. Try to familiarize yourself. Say the names out loud. I think that's going to truly help you to try to start identifying with these characters. And because the for names are foreign, that might put you off a little bit. But just don't feel overwhelmed because they will become familiar with these characters. Well, and the characters are so endearing that I greatly... I mean, I think when people read this, they're like, oh my gosh, this is hysterical. Like, Yes, this this book is funny. It starts out as a comedy. And we start out with Fyodor Karamazov, who is this Epicurean. He's Han Solo. Yeah, Han Solo <laughs> type character. And we see the way he treats his first two wives, like, wives, right? Like the first one he marries for money and he becomes rich off her dowry, basically. And then, you know, she runs away chasing this other, you know, religious man. Then she, he marries the second wife who was, you know, very beautiful, but he didn't seem to appreciate her. Instead, he abused her and kind of uh, threw these orgies. And, and it, it sounds terrible, but it is funny I, in a w weird kind of way. But it's setting up this <laughs> character. And at the same time, the author, you know, Dostoevsky, he tells you, oh, this guy's going to die. Don't get attached to him. And then we start with him. And that, I think, helps us distance so that we can spend a little bit of time with each of these characters in the opening section. Yeah, if you know where to put your focus in, that's going to help as well. So again, not to kind of toot our own horn, but if you go check out our before video, that's going to help you a lot start to organize your thoughts as you go through this book so you can digest it and enjoy it because it is very enjoyable if you get that negative mindset out of the way real quick. So how does Theodore process this world, Crypto? Pleasure! He tries to maximize his pleasure, and I think this is Dostoevsky's way of kind of ripping at this lifestyle. You're supposed to kind of be like, yeah, you're kind of, you're funny, but at the expense of causing ruination and danger to others. We're supposed <laughs> to judge Theodore a little bit. That Dostoevsky isn't making him a likable character just because we a start little bit? with him. I think just you're supposed to judge a lot of it. <laughs> I, I think that Dostoevsky is expecting you to judge every single one of these characters. And if you watch the live stream, the whole time when we were kind of quizzing all the other you know, participants, we're like, well, who are you? Who are you? Because we knew they judged all of these people and saw themselves in some of those people, right? <laughs> So next comes along Dimitri, right? The the romantic and militaristic son who is in need of his money. And he says, Fyodor, this guy that's totally unreliable. I, I need that money that I'm relying upon you for. And it's kind of sets up this comedy of events and, and, and back and forth between money between these two for the rest of the book. Now, didn't you say that you saw yourself as Dimitri this time reading through for your third read through? Well, how does Dimitri process the world? Through money. Through action is what I would say. He is a guy that oh, okay. who does things to draw out things. And we'll see that in the next section where I, we talked about this in the live stream, right? We'll put a link to that in the description down below too. He specifically is saying the wrong things to these monks so that they will correct him. Just by taking action, that's what that's what implores others to come out and, and almost drive out the truth is kind of how Dimitri reacts to to his environment wait a minute you do this to me all the time i think someone's got to guide the reckless right <laughs> oh dang it i see what you've been doing all this time <laughs> so up next we have ivan and alyosha right devil and good person is one way to look at them you know oh come on universal no. universal morals versus versus uh biblical morals these characters are meant to oppose each other is one way to put it and Yvonne is kind of the thinky rationalist for this novel right? okay that's more fair I, I i would very much be not offended but it'd be like all right you obviously 
are looking at this from a very skewed perspective per se because you look more towards Alyusha if you're looking so negatively upon Yvonne. And I don't think that's fair. They're definitely the opposite. They're the, they're the same. They're different sides of the same coin. But I don't think there should be such a negative connotation to well. When to I say Ivan. when I say plays the devil, you've heard the term playing devil's advocate, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, so he that's is, fair. Okay, he's specifically drawing out these very casual situations, and boy, does he lay it out in in book five coming up in our next chat. But he <laughs> he is specifically playing devil's advocate almost to Alyusha is more the line that I was kind of going for when I say that. Okay, okay, good, good, good. I like that. I like that analogy. So Alyusha on the other side, he's the the very... Okay, so Ivan, how does he process the world first? Through thinking. Alyosha, however, on the opposite side, instead of thinking, and then, you know, Spiritual. If, you to, if you feel me to slam the other side, right? Instead of thinking, faith. It's, it's faith, it's believing, right? Not necessarily having the fact draw out the conclusion, but having faith to, to you know, there's that quote about does the miracle draw out the faith or does faith, uh, you know, be, have the miracle come born of it. That's Alyusha on the other side where he believes and that's what makes things happen for him. That's how he processes the world. How do they say it in the Santa Claus movie? Believing is seeing or seeing is believing. <laughs> it's a lot easier to process if you don't understand Alyusha's character. That's kind of what it comes down to, right? <laughs> yeah. And then the other last kind of main character that I really want to spend some time on just for book one is Father Zosima, who if you've read Crime and Punishment, we mentioned this in the live stream too, is you know, Dostoevsky likes to put a moral compass in each novel. So in Crime and Punishment, it was Sonia. Sonia was the one that was representing Dostoevsky as close as possible in terms of the moral compass of the book. Father Zosima is the the spearhead for the spirituality of this book, where he's the one that's going to be more aligned with Dostoevsky's views when it comes to what he thinks the right answer is. Love boat, father in the love boat. So how does he <laughs> process the world yeah through love, through love. Act, active love specifically right <laughs> whoa whoa keep it pg there una all right let's move into book two so what happens in book two they head to the monastery where Fyodor rips out into everyone basically they meet we meet lisa liza basically alyusha's baby boo who sits in a wheelchair and has night terrors kind of sad and zosima the elder comes out to kind of see through everybody's lies as they gather around the monastery and, and, and basically are seeking attention so soon Ivan arrives and they talk about a separation of church and state article that he's written dimitri arrives late and alyosha leaves and meets rakitin in the forest so when you look at like the plot of a Dostoevsky novel, we haven't really hit too much plotting so much. They're kind of gathering at this monastery to settle debates, and then there's some philosophical arguments that happen along the way. Yeah, see, now this is where I would say that this is the part where you're getting kind of that information and that it's if you imagine this was like a TV show, this is where the narrator would start giving you all that background information of world building that you need to know to understand the story that's to come. And I, I really love this scene because it really does give you a lot of information, but it, it doesn't feel overwhelming at all. Well, and we see some of the characters play out more of their themes, right? Fyodor comes out, he acts the fool more, and we start to get introduced to a little bit more of this concept of the holy fool, a little bit more of the concept of Fyodor is specifically acting a fool to take on the sins of others. In the Bible, in and even in early Christianity, when you look at the martyrs and the, you know, Rome was, was the home side of two very famous martyrs and such, martyrs taking on the being the fool and suffering is a very Christian concept, and not that other religions don't have it, but it's very core to Christianity. And we see Fyodor kind of foolishly taking on the suffering of others is kind of one way to look at how he's being positioned right now, right? Yeah, and we've talked about before that Fyodor is the self-laceration, modeling this bad behavior and trying to be the, the worst of the worst, so to speak. And so you've got a little bit of a lie in his his intentions, I guess, there. A lie is not the right word, but it's not being true. And then, you know, we talked earlier about how this is where Dimitri comes in and specifically says things that aren't really true, specifically to rile up individuals. All examples of lies. And it continues <laughs> to go outside, right? Like we talked about earlier with Madame Koklova and, and Liza or Lisa or, Li or Lisa. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But you have Father Zosima that even calls her. He's just like, yeah. 
you know, you can love humanity from afar and say you love them, but, you know, when you get up close and you say, I love mes- men less in particular, you know, would you love the leper when they're right next to you, that sort of thing. He's seeing through the lies, too, of you, you know, you aren't actively loving. He's, it's again, that's Father Zosi about how he processes the world is through that, uh, the three questions ideal of who do you love, the person next to you, what do you do, you love them, and when do you do it, you love them now, right? Like, that's how Father Zosima experience his life and that's how he calls out the lies that that he's kind of setting up in these chapters i also like how they set up too and again i kind of see myself uh, more as yvonne but i do like kind of dimitri here because i feel like he's the one that really sets out that idea of the sins of the father because he's kind of portraying almost like he's Theodore Jr. Mm. And that we're going to mm. see this more as we go through the rest of the book. Obviously, no spoilers up to this point. But I really feel like you first start to see the the sons for them true, their true selves in relationship to Fyodor. And Dimitri really kind of encapsulates that. Well, and then Yvonne sets up a very important concept in this section, too. Let's not skip over this. Of the moral argument, right? In terms of philosophy, in terms of how we... What's what's hip to talk about? What's the cool way to say that God is real in terms of the Kalam ontological argument, teleol, teleological argument? You know, there's there's various fads that have hit philosophy and theology throughout the years that it's cool to talk about. And and Dostoevsky is going to bring in the moral argument as kind of one of the main things to kind of hit in this story. And one of the concepts of that is, you know, without without God, do we have a universal morality? Is there good and bad if you don't have God? Or if because we have bad, does that prove that there is a God? The whole theodicy argument, basically. Or theodicy argument. Or, or religion or spirituality, however you want to take it. If you love, you are of God. All things are stoned, for all things are saved by love. Sounds very powerful, and I think, you know— A good way to think about this when you're talking about someone is you're going to have people that have a heavy religious background, and they're like, yes, Father Zosima, you are right. And then you have the atheists who are going to read this, and when Yvonne starts talking, they're like, yes, Yvonne, you are the smartest. You are right. And I (laughs) I think Dostoevsky does a fairly good job of presenting analogies, presenting disanalogies, presenting arguments, and then the counters. He does a pretty good job, I feel like. He still is biased. I mean, who isn't? Everyone's going to present things in a biased way. But this is probably his best book at presenting both sides of the argument. And he's going to get more into it with the next section. But Yvonne clearly yeah. sets up at this <laughs> Come point. Come on. Book five, pre- just pretty good? Come on. <laughs> so, so he does a pretty good job in this section with Yvonne setting up the concept <laughs> of, you know, if you have the church blended in with the state, can you truly have a a a global look at what does morality mean. And, you know, when the church excommunicates people, right, it says, well, what's going to cause them to want to come back and to want to be good? And I think you need to ask those questions of where does goodness come from? Is it coming from where your religion says from? Is it coming from where your state says what is good coming from? These are all important things that we need to figure out and probably take for granted. Universal questions of almost as deep as what is the meaning of life? Where do we come from, right? I mean, those are equally as important, I think. At least that's what he's kind of portraying in the book through these brothers. Let's move into book three. Let's keep the train rolling here. In book three, we learn that Fyodor's servant Grigory and Smerdyakov, their backstory, very tragic. We learn about Dmitri's backstory with the colonel and how he became betrothed with Katrina and an exchange of money. Dmitri and Fyodor both want to hook up with Grushenka, so (laughs) Dmitri tries to dish off Katerina onto his brother Ivan. Real so many cool. people get mad at her, man. It's not her fault. <laughs> She's just getting dished off in these love triangles left and right. Oh, man. We have what I call a communion-like meal, but no one seems to agree with me when I say that. But hey, I, this, <laughs> this is my video. Where we learn Smerdy- hey, Do what you want, brother. Where we learn Smerdyakov's backstory is about how he takes cats and hangs them, but then he buries them. So it kind of represents, well, okay, now I can use the devil, heaven- and and hell devil and God analogy with him because he kind of has both of those sides in him, right? And we talk about the and then we talk about the good of church where Fyodor talks about how it serves no value, be gone with it. And again, Yvonne sets once more that domino of universal morality where it says, hey, the church is good. I don't believe in it, but I think it does good because if if those people didn't have the church telling them that stealing was wrong, first thing they're gonna do is come take your money, Fyodor. And that's when Fyodor's like, uh I don't like religion. (laughs) 
he really doesn't have an answer to that too no. and I, I love that his sons are uh, you know stepping up to their father questioning him and that they're basically better at arguing than he is well they're also there's there's papers out there we're not going to cover it but there's papers out there that talk about the father being so definitional where he defines dimitri's actions but he repels in two very different ways in terms of the faith versus the atheist view of how ivan and Alyosha are repelled the opposite way the father behaves interestingly enough you think that is driven by their their greed the sins their emotions i think it's Guided by Dostoevsky deciding that he's a smarter and brighter than I could possibly ever be a critic of. So, <laughs> so Dimitri Fair breaks enough. in, declares his passion to the world that would lead him to kill his father for Grushenka. Really bad idea to admit that you would kill someone. Dude, Dimitri, have you? <laughs> really bad Don't idea. Don't you know we were told this guy's going to die and you just admitted uh, premeditated yeah, you, murder, dude? Were you not listening to that <laughs> random narrator in the village that nobody knows his name, but he just kind of randomly <laughs> pops up and tells everyone's thoughts and, and feelings occasionally? Well, not, he doesn't know everything, but he's he's about as close to omniscient as a, as a, a dude in the village comes. Yeah, it's like the random person walking around the street has the we are all doomed sign. Like, you didn't read his sign. <laughs> okay, small side note. Best usage of that narrator is almost kind of like a little flip. Have you ever seen the movie Christmas with the Cranks? Oh, yeah, with Tim Allen. Yeah, the, and the, the whole time you have that guy, like the Santa Claus suit that's kind of in the background. You meet him at the wine store only to find out that he was Santa Claus the whole time. Spoilers for that movie, but hey, great great twist. <laughs> great twist of the narrator matting, mat, mattering there. But then later, Alyosha talks with Katerina, and they find out that Grushenka was listening the whole time, that, that those silly, dun, dun, scheming dun. women, right? How dare they, those foils of each other. All right, let's get into and, this. Come on, you can imagine how cool that would be if it was a movie, right? Because you would see the scene from their perspective, and then like later in the movie... You would see it from the camera pulling out, and she was standing there the whole time. Ooh, that mm. would be so good. It would be super dramatic. Oh, that'd be good. Oh, that, the curtain pull would be so dramatic. Whoosh! Oh, it would be. <laughs> yeah, and then the music behind it. Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> so we talked about it a little bit here, but um, we're going more and more into the idea of martyrs being important to Christianity in this, and the way that Fyodor is taking on the sins, acting the fool for people. And uh, they talk a little bit about it in the section too, right? Yeah, we talked about the divide of kind of religion here, and I think this is really setting up books four and five where we get into the really deep religious discussions that are, you know, coming. This is this is the preface to all the religious discussion before of the different churches and the beliefs, and we get a little bit more ideology in this in this book. Right. So Grigory tells his story actually about the the Lukyanov, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but that Russian soldier. And Fyodor kind of starts to idolize that martyr because that's what he is. He's pushing for things that are like him. And that's another key thing about this novel is you'll notice the characters kind of go be around things that are like them, right? It's almost like a self-validation technique. Who does Alyosha go and hang out with? The monks. He's trying to be like yeah. them, right? Monk. You know, Yep. Exactly. And then, you know, Dimitri coming back and living with the father and stuff like that. It's You'll notice that there's lots of little small things that characters, almost kind of like politics, right? I'm going to go hang out and just agree with everyone that's like me and then just try and, you know, not be around people that aren't like me is, is what some people go through. Oh, yeah. If you looked at these guys' Twitter feed, it would be everybody that it subscribes to the exact same belief systems that they have. There would be no controversy, no different opinions whatsoever. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I like that tweet. I'll retweet that. That was exactly what would happen. Dude, 100%. Like, if you had, like, a little line feed, you'd have, like, a picture of... of the, um You'd have a picture of Fyodor walking out with the bank with his his three K and cash. Next line it says it says Dimitri unfollowed Fyodor. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. That's so true. Uh, that's so continuing funny. that theme of serfdom to bring it back to sadness, right? We're we're doing a Russian book. We had to keep coming back to the sadness, right? You've got Grigory the servant, who, you know, if you didn't know what serfdom was, it's not fair to compare it to slavery, but it's the closest that I think most Americans can kind of latch onto. Not because of race, but because of people being tied to land because of class. And it's over. It's abolished. It's free. We're no longer a serfdom state here in Russia. And Grigory still stays with his master, almost out of loyalty. 
but maybe out of wanting to be the martyr, maybe out of self-laceration too. This is one of his own forms of self-inflicted suffering is a way to look at this. Dostoevsky does such a great job of writing such complex characters, even somebody that's not one of the main brothers. And I love this idea because it really is true. A lot of times these serfs, they had nowhere else to go, but they also were so committed and it was the only life that they knew why would they give up something that was comfortable? Even sometimes when we're in a bad situation, it feels comfortable and change is hard, even if it's going to a, uh, going from a negative to a positive change. Change is still tough, even if things get better for you. Right. And I think sometimes how do you deal with that grief, right? Grigory just suffers through it and he feels himself as positive being a martyr for it, right? And then you have on the opposite side you know, of class, you have Katerina, who was just quote from like a noble gentleman or unknown noble gentleman was the quote from the novel. And she's more to representing the upper class. And what does she do to buy off some of that grief? She basically pays for anything that she can. She tries to buy Dimitri when he kind of rejects her and starts to walk away. When Dimitri later in this next you know book here gets in that argument with the farmer, what does she do to buy off you know the mistake that that Dimitri did? She tries to give uh, Captain Snigirov money. She's she's doing what her class has taught her, which is to buy off problems and throw money at issues. And that's her way of dealing with suffering in a sense. Yeah, I think that's going to set up some of our problems that we see later in the book too. So again, just kind of weaving those complex webs to set the stage for what is to come later. Last little bullet point I want to talk about with this book three is how they keep been comparing the Karamazovs to animals. Uh, you see authors do this a lot in terms of, you know, William Faulkner did it a lot with comparing uh, the Snopes to, to rodents and stuff like that. And a lot of it is to give characteristics to these creatures. So we're comparing the Karamazovs to insects, to insects, sensual lust, right? Not only speaking <laughs> of what do the insects want, right? They don't have a, again, very good Dostoevsky, again, bringing in that moral argument for people not to have noticed, perhaps. Are insects governed by any type of moral law? All sensual, right? No. They, they, they no. have that no. still that old style brain, that snake brain. Right, right. Reptile brain. They talked about the reptile eating. Yeah. Was it a viper eating itself from some type of reptile eating itself? I survive good. I die bad. I mate good. Me no mate bad. This is what the Karamazovs <laughs> are being set up because they're kind of comparing the Karamazovs to not being governed by any type of moral law, whether it be biblical or if you believe in universal morality. And that's kind of what, again, Dostoevsky brilliantly kind of sneaking into that little subject right there. And that's kind of what Ivan brings up when he says to Alyosha, Alyosha, my little angel. And Alyosha is compared to an angel, I think, by two different characters in this section. He says, you're an angel, but you're still a Karamazov. You still have some insect in you. And do we see Alyosha fall? I don't know. We'll talk about that as this book goes on. But he's planting the seed that even though you try to be holy, sin st you know, if the faith is going to say sin cre crept in, you had weakness. The atheist is going to say you reverted to your you know, natural desires and stuff like that. There's, there's lots of different ways to, to process this from your worldview, which is part of why I think from a video perspective, since I don't know who you are from an audience member when I'm talking to you, I kind of have to call some of these out because there's people that will argue from a place of, you know, of theology where you assume God is real and that's not on the table. And there's people that are going to be arguing at this from a place of philosophy where you don't assume God exists. And, and the arguments are much different based on that audience, which is why I might point some of these things out and why it can be difficult to talk about this book with different audience members. Do you think that we've talked about this before as people identify with the different brothers and to kind of follow up with that to, you know, we're talking to an audience and this is kind of a one way venue because they can't really talk back unless you leave a comment down in the discussion and we can have a discussion down in the comments below. But do you think that as people read through this book the first time, do you think because most people I think want to be good, they want to be moral, whether you get that from God or your parents or culture or society or state or government or whatever, do you think most people identify with Aliusha because of that reason? They want to see the good in themselves. And if they can see the good in him, who is tr almost being corrupted by his family, that then there is hope for themselves? I don't know, because... Uh, spoilers for the future section, I can't go into my answer fully. 
for that. I know, I, I know. What I can answer is that with Yvonne, he's going to be the pillar for, I think, some people. And you'll see some evil in him throughout it, as you see evil in all characters in a Dostoevsky novel. But I really think that these characters represent us and we see ourselves in it more so than what we're more so than us judging them, I guess, is kind of how it reflect that your your question. There. I guess maybe I should. But I guess do you think most people latch on to Alyusha first because they want to be good and he is the representation of good? Dude, Fyodor is so funny in the first section. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this thing is a lot's going on in these first four books, you know, with all of the the people that are being introduced and trying to learn the names. And I just feel like that that's somebody that they can they can latch on to, even if maybe they don't by the end and they change to Dimitri or Yvonne. I feel like that he's safe, right? Alyosha is a safe bet. Dude, Alyosha's told of all of those three brothers, Alyosha is the one you bring home to your parents. You know what I mean? Like, that, Yvonne, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you know, he's good. He's smart. But I don't know if I trust him. You need to have my my daughter back by midnight. You know what I mean? And Dimitri, it's more like I'm chaperoning you two on your date. But Alyosha, here's the keys to the car, kid. Bring her back. At her yeah, I mean, more, I, right. OK, oh, 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 OK. Alyosha, you ever seen the Big Bang Theory? I've seen a couple episodes. Yeah. Alyusha is Leonard. Yvonne is Sheldon. And Dimitri <laughs> is one of the other guys that are just interested in women. Uh, and do, and do <laughs> Probably the, Howard. And, and, the, and the father, Fyodor, is that, that actress Kelly, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I know. I agree. I mean, it's something like that, you know. And I think that uh, I think that in the beginning, you try to latch on to something that makes you feel good because you're trying to hold on to something as you go through this because – it, it it it's tough, you know. It's tough, isn't that? Isn't that exactly to our point? Oh my gosh, I did. I, we didn't mean to do this. We talked earlier about how you try to put yourself around things that are like you. And yep. isn't that what we do? Where I think if you're heavily religious, you don't have to tell me like like. I know when I say these comments, like if you're heavily religious, typically you associate with Alyosha. And I'm, I'm thinking of very specific people who've said they liked Alyosha and I know what their religion is, right? And I know there's going to be an atheist down below. It's like, I right, associated with Alyosha. I got it. I'm just saying statistically. And the people that are atheistic are going to be more like, you know, either Fyodor or, or Yvonne. Like we see ourselves in it and we want to be around things like ourselves, almost as self-validation to our earlier analytical point. Yeah, that's so true. Even this early in the book, which is pretty amazing because we're only three books in. I mean, technically, we've kind of talked a little bit about book four, but okay, let's, that's let's pretty hit, incredible. Let's, let's, hit, let's hit book four real quick, right? So summary, okay. <laughs> they return to the monastery. Father Farapont is a absolute trip. Alyosha promises to love Lisa no matter what. Alyosha, can I just call her Lisa? I'm going with Lisa from here out, just so you know. <laughs> Lisa. Al- Al- Alyusha stumbles upon school kids <laughs> that are throwing rocks and they begin to target him. So he visits Captain Snigirov's home. They find out about the boy, his backstory, about how Dimitri got into an argument with this guy. And the captain offers to beat the boy. <laughs> and Alyosha's like, uh, best not to. <laughs> uh, no, let's not do that. Right. And then Captain Snigirov's like, uh, I spit upon your money. Go return it. I ain't, I ain't accepting that, which a lot of people are like. Dude, that was free money. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I think that's a really good point here. I think that we start to see, and this is where people start to empathize a lot with Alyusha, is because we see that divide of material possessions and the moralistic view on money as, you know, greed as a sin here as well. And that's going to be kind of a reoccurring theme, you know, that you see bounce between all three brothers, although maybe more focused on Dimitri than in anybody else. I do think that you do see that a little bit here in Aliusha. Well, and to put it bluntly, sometimes, let's be realistic, sometimes you associate with a character just because you spend the most time with them. I know you're like, oh, I never do that. I'm telling you, there are some people that will do that. And we spend a lot of time following the celibate, religious almost monk character Alyusha as he is going scene to scene with us bringing toting us along in his back pocket like a little tiny Pomeranian puppy and we witness these scenes right and isn't oh, it's it, red it, car theory completely right you get a red car all you see is red cars right right so okay so let's talk about this scene particularly because it's kind of interesting because Ilyusha the little boy says father he asked 
Are the rich people stronger than anyone else on earth? Yes, Alyusha, I said. There are no people stronger than the rich. Father, he said, I will get rich. I will become an officer and conquer everybody. Gee, do you think he's talking about class? <laughs> yeah, this is one where I think that it's very blatant that Dostoevsky is slapping you across the face with the Russian class divide of the upper elites who have money and they're in power. These are the ones that are in the government. And that was very important in you know 19th century Russia. Well, not just 19th century Russia, for most of Russian history, that was very, very important. And I think he's trying to make a point here of these how important this was to these sons because it's instilled by their fathers. Well, and you have to remember too, I mean, well, first of all, it's almost kind of melodramatic, like how painted poor this Captain Snigiroff is. Like it's, it's really played up how poor he is. But you have to remember too that the socially, culturally, there was a much bigger divide between upper class and lower class in Russia. There's a much. I think people nowadays can see that. Well, and there's <laughs> the billionaires we have. There's a much. Well, there's a much bigger lower class too. Like America actually has a, a, a bigger middle class than than Russia particularly did in this era, from what we know about economical data, right? So yeah. we have to keep in mind that this was. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so melodramatic. This is so poor, and yes, it, it is. But this wasn't unheard of or so rare in those days this was i don't want to say the norm this is obviously more destitute but this wasn't too crazy of a reach to say i'm painting this is my lower class representation in that era particularly post serfdom uh you know I, you got to look at it. They're trying to figure out how do we move forward into this industrial age now that we've kind of given away our free labor right yeah. And one thing that people might not know is that in these divides of like upper, middle and lower class, there is divides in those classes as well, where there is lower, lower class, there's lower middle class and lower upper class. And so, you know, he, he Snirgov is being like, lower, lower class. And it's almost to the point of ridiculousness. But I think it has to be so that your reader understands it. Right. Well, I think we meant to say lower or upper lower class or something like that in one video. And we like flipped it by accident by saying like upper middle class. We, we made a mistake when we were talking oh, okay. about. Dostoevsky. Probably my fault. It, it doesn't matter, but we got called out by it. And the guy's <laughs> like, don't you notice the difference between these? And I'm like, yeah, we, we made a mistake. I'm sorry. These videos, you can't go back and re-edit. Like we, we say things incorrectly sometimes, but just make sure that we keep that in mind because that's going to be important, right? We've already seen it with Gregory. Right. Yes. I'm, I'm staying here as the martyr on this land. We've seen the opposite with Katarina of just, I have problems. You know, that's why this whole scene was crafted was so that Ilyusha, the Alyosha, oh, the name's difference, Alyosha could give her, um, give Katarina's money to Captain Snigirov. And what does he say about that money, right? Get lost. And I think that's what confuses most people is that that concept of, of pride and uh, why would he reject that money when his family needs it so badly, I think, is one of the questions a lot of people have. Yeah, so I think you can kind of tie this back to the beginning that, you know, Fyodor's throwing these parties, these big orgies, that this is, you know, very lavish and important. And you kind of have this concept that's very circular here with these themes kind of throughout books one through four. And then we're going to get a big curveball coming in book five. The rich and their money throw it away. The younger and their money don't want it. They want to earn They don't want to receive it. They want to earn it, right? Uh, they want to have their pride and dignity when they earn their money, I guess, in a sense. So, okay, so we just we just zoomed at lightning speed through books one through four. We wanted to, you know, put some ideas out there. What we're going to do is we're going to come back to them. Trust me, we ain't getting away from the moral discussion. And we're going to probably, what I think I want to do is maybe do a little bit more of like a history of it, kind of how that, you know, came back in times. Like some people will point out that there's a specific book that Dostoevsky may be referring to. But, you know, these are fads that happened and how people have brought them up over time. It's going to be a it's going to be a wild ride through rebellion in the, in the Grand Inquisitor is all I'm going to say. Who will be ready for that one? <laughs> so guys, if you are new to the Codex Cantina, we publish videos every Monday and Thursday. We do in-depth breakdowns on some of the greatest novels like this of all time, as well as short story discussions. If you're down for literature and you know, what do these, what do these texts mean to us type of discussions, please hit that subscribe button to join us on the journey. Again, playlist down below where you can check out our brother's Karamazov talks if you are 
just kind of catching up or just caught here by Google. Please join us on the discussion of this. Una out. Peace.